President Biden met with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau Tuesday. It's the president's first official meeting with a world leader since taking office. CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe has the details. During his first virtual summit today with a world leader, President Biden and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau maintained that the two countries are working on being better neighbors. The United States has no closer friend, no closer friend than Canada. The meeting was designed to reset a relationship that had strained over the past four years, part of former President Donald Trump's sometimes cold relationships with allies. Today, Trudeau made note of the change. U.S. leadership has been sorely missed uh, over the past uh, past years. Meanwhile, the president is facing a major confirmation battle as Neera Tandon, his choice for White House budget director, is struggling to sustain support. West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin says he won't back her, citing years of sharply critical statements by Tandon about members of both parties. In the 50-50 Senate, any Democratic defection can be fatal for a Biden pick. The White House is standing by Tandon. There's one candidate to lead the budget department. Her name is Neera Tandon. Ed O'Keefe joins me now from the White House. So, Ed, as we saw in your piece, President Biden met with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. What more can you tell us about their talks and their goals for U.S.-Canadian relations? Well, the, the goal is to make sure that they are in better shape than they have been for the past four years. Trudeau and Former President Trump uh, were, I guess, in essence, frenemies by the end of it all. Uh, the president, the <laughs> former president, not known to really enjoy engaging with him or other world leaders or cooperating with them, at least, uh, when it came to global issues of concern like climate change, trade policy and whatnot. He famously walked out of a G7 meeting a few years ago uh, and required them all to have to rewrite the uh, joint statement or issue it without the United States because he had essentially said he wasn't interested in it, which was a sort of unprecedented move at the time. True no love lost. We know at one point a few years ago he was caught on camera on a hot mic talking to other world leaders and sort of, uh, you know, uh, mocking President Trump. So from a personal level and from a policy standpoint, there really was, was, uh, was big disagreement. And at one point today in the opening statements that they made, uh, Trudeau mentioned the fact that President Biden takes a far more serious and substantive view of climate change, and he said quite explicitly, U.S. leadership is a very welcome thing uh, compared to the last few years. So uh, notable that uh, Trudeau really was kind of uh, calling out the old elephant in the room and saying, you know, you are a, a marked improvement compared to your predecessor. Uh, Mr. Biden, for his part, eager to demonstrate that he is rebuilding that U.S.-Canada relationship. Remember, Canada's America's largest trading partner. There are some disagreements right now regarding the decision by the president to stop construction of the Keystone XL pipeline and doubling down on this Buy American initiative that President Trump also had in place, but that President Biden intends to actually enforce a little more aggressively. There's always concern when that kind of thing gets started here in the United States because Canadian manufacturing is so reliant on American manufacturing, and the preference would always be that it be by North American, not just by American, but that, that's not expected to be the case in this case. Uh, also notable that both of these leaders today discussed the fact that to them, issues of racial injustice, uh, promoting and ensuring diversity across society are big priorities and things that they both intend to keep working on. When Trudeau campaigned for prime minister a few years ago was a big theme of his election. Of course, President Biden and Vice President Harris made it a big part of theirs as well last year. Yeah, that, that was uh, notable in President Biden's remarks. It's not something that we've necessarily heard from uh, in previous kind of bilateral meetings with yeah. presidents. Um, let me ask you also about uh, this meeting that the president held. It was a roundtable with black essential workers. What was his message to them? Well, this is building on the administration's continued push to get the COVID relief package passed. Remember, it's set to be passed by the House later this week or over the weekend. The bigger hurdle may be getting it through the Senate. So today he was meeting with four essential workers from across the country, a firefighter, a daycare center worker, uh, a woman who works in a pharmacy, uh, and another guy who works for the hy V supermarket chain that's based in the Midwest. All of them essential workers. This was designed to acknowledge that the White House is aware of the work that essential workers are doing across the country, the dangers that they face. And he also talked to them a little bit about making sure that they are helping to promote taking the vaccine in their communities. Remember, there are concerns about whether 
minorities in this country, especially African Americans, will sign up or will show up. And the president was asking them questions about that. The pharmacist notably said she actually hasn't heard very many concerns about taking it. It's more questions about when they actually will be able to. And remember, he also was talking about something that we will be watching closely, his goal of ensuring that about 100 million vaccinations have been injected into the arms of Americans by the 100-day mark of his presidency in late April. As of now, we're at about 48 to 50 million of those shots uh, with about uh, a month and a half or so to go. Yeah, we're definitely keeping a close eye on that. Uh, meantime, CBS News reports that at least 179 migrant children spent more than three days in border facilities in January. Now, DHS policy states that migrant children should be released within 72 hours. And you asked White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki about this. Let's go ahead and play that exchange. So there's the criticism that mm -hmm. was made by candidates Biden and Harris. Mm -hmm. And then there's the criticism concerned now of these attorneys who work with and represent these children who say, this isn't much different than what the Trump administration was doing. Well, say you. Let, me, let me first say that you're right, that kids, there's about a 72-hour time, time frame uh, where kids should be transferred from CBP facilities to HHS-sponsored facilities. And that is certainly our objective. In terms of the specific kids um, that you mentioned, I would send you to DHS to give you more information on that. Uh, but that is not, uh, that is not what we are uh, hoping to achieve. We want these kids to be uh, in facilities where they are getting access to uh, health and medical assistance, to education. As you know, there are a number who have come into the country, and we're trying to manage that as well and ensure that we uh, are able to transfer them as quickly as possible, not just to stay in the HHS facilities either, to get them into families and, and uh, sponsored homes. Uh, that is our human and moral objective from, from this administration. So, Ed, what more do we know about the administration's actual plans for these children? And look, this is part of a broader concern or criticism or sort of observation that immigrant advocates have had in recent weeks, and that is that what the Biden administration is up to doesn't look that much different than what the Trump administration was doing in dealing with the influx of especially unaccompanied minors that continue to cross the border, a few hundred a day by some estimates. And couple this news about what's going on at Customs and Border Protection facilities, where traditionally or usually it's supposed to be adults that are housed, uh, with the word today in a, in a big Washington Post report about the reopening of a facility that's run by the Department of Health and Human Services that's now housing children that had been opened for about a month during the Trump administration and was then shut down amid fierce criticism because they were using it. The Biden administration says they had to reopen it because due to COVID concerns and the need to keep fewer children further apart from each other, distancing, uh, they didn't have enough space. So they've reopened this privately run facility. The goal, however, is not to keep these children there, but to get them moving to family members here in the United States or to some kind of foster care system. And they point out correctly, it's not that kind of facility that has, in essence, you know, barbed wire fencing or caging. Uh, where they're keeping children. It is more of a shelter uh, with beds and with rooms that are decorated, with cafeteria space for them to eat. But regardless, you've got hundreds of children uh, mm -hmm. being housed together without, uh, you know, family members or other adult supervision. Saki admitting the administration is still working on this, and they continue to call for immigrants not to make the journey north into Mexico over the U.S. border, saying the United States is still trying to sort out what to do. But despite those calls, the immigrants keep coming, and the Biden administration having many of the same problems that the Trump administration did. And it will be curious to see whether the Biden administration gets the same kind of criticism that the Trump administration did, especially from Democrats and other immigrant allies who are more prone to support President Biden. Yeah, all of this happening with the added complication and difficulty and the challenges of the pandemic. Um, right. Ed, finally, we know uh, that the president and the first lady are going to be traveling to Texas on Friday following last week's winter storm that led to that power and water crisis. Do we have any details yet on his trip? Uh, what is he going to be doing there? What's he, he planning to uh, actually achieve or, or accomplish while he's there? There's going to be at least two stops, according to the White House. He'll meet with local leaders uh, who are responding to this environmental, humanitarian, and energy disaster, uh, but will also visit a vaccination site in the Houston area 
where they are giving out the vaccine to people. This is an opportunity for him now to venture outside of a government-run facility here in the Washington area and see how the vaccine is being distributed somewhere far from Washington. Uh, there was some talk, the president had mentioned last week, that he was planning on making a trip to Texas this week. We don't know yet for certain, but this may have been what it was, and that was to visit a, vaccina a mass vaccination mm -hmm. site that has been set up. So be curious to see what that is like for him. But remember, he had said he was eager to visit the White House, putting it off a few days after this storm to give the Houston area an opportunity to start sorting out what it needs and then make arrangements for a big visit by the president. All right, Ed O'Keefe, following it all from the White House for us. Ed, thank you.